Let's open our Bibles, Revelation chapter 2. The one who commented about the video was me. <laughs> we were kind of joking about it. You know, we, we screen these things ahead of time. Um, you know, but kind of when you're in the moment and you get kind of the, the whole feel of it, it's like, geez. It was just a little somber, right? Anyway, I thought it was a little somber. You guys are so gracious. You just didn't think anything bad about it at all. You were just tissuing your eyes a little bit. <laughs> anyway, I won't go on and on about that. If you're new here this morning, we're working our way through the New Testament verse by verse. We're in Revelation chapter 2, verse 18. We've got some new babies in our fellowship right now. It's so wonderful. Verse 18 of chapter 2, and this morning we take a look at the next letter in line, Jesus writing to his church, and this is the title that we're going to affix to it. You can write it in your bulletins, Discernment for Dangerous Days. How relevant is such a thought topic and this letter is to us today? I pray we will see. How many of us read ahead? Uh, and let, let's do it. Let's be bold. Let's raise our hands nice and high. How many of us read ahead? And yeah, you like half raise it. It's cool. It's cool. If you're a visitor, you're totally off the hook, so don't feel bad. Whew. If you read this, you don't get extra spiritual brownie points or whatever, but maybe you've been praying for me because I tell you what, this is a tough letter, not only to read, but to teach. It went, you know, fairly well for service. I hope it will, will go the same way. Let's go to the Lord. Lord, as we read in, in each and every one of these letters, you exhort us. Because we have opportunity to hear, and not just hear, but to receive into our hearts, as we say, to listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. God, what else are we here for? We're not a club. We're not just a social group, but we're disciples of Jesus Christ. And as we confess that, Lord, we choose to follow you, no turning back. We are thankful and, Lord, inspired as we remember that you want to speak to us today. As I pray, the image comes through with crystal clarity. You're a perfect parent to your kids. And you are passionate about us. You are defensive of us. You are protective. And we're so grateful for that today. It's only the, the prodigal spirit, which sometimes we have, we confess, that doesn't appreciate your parenting. But Lord, even as we're prodigal, even, Lord, as we remain faithful, we can't deny your affection because we see the attention you give us, the time you take to speak to us and tenderly turn us to you. We can't deny your love. We may not appreciate it sometimes, Lord, if we're turning, running, resisting, feeling the consequences of foolish choices. But even as that may be the case for some today, Lord, would it be your love that we see supersede even ourselves and our waywardness, our problems, our struggles? Your word speaks so perfectly to our waywardness, our many conditions, our culture, your church today. And God, though it may hurt or sting at first, we just want to embrace it knowing that you love us, knowing that we forever have your favor, that the love of God is never in question as we see the cross that sits before us and remember the one who hung on it for our sin. Thank you for your love, God. As you speak, Lord, pretty seriously to this church and to us today, would we Lord, by the power of your Spirit, embrace and investigate our lives to see, Lord, how these things apply. Thank you that your word is perfect, and we want to simply, perfectly read it 
Study it. Give understanding to it today. Bless your people, God. Meet our needs as you see us here in our seats. What a pleasure it is to open your word with our brothers and sisters this morning. Be honored, we pray. Above all else, be glorified. In Jesus' name, let's say together, amen, amen. Oliver Goldsmith said this. It's kind of comical, so you can laugh. If you feel comfortable, you can laugh. We like to laugh at ourselves sometimes. I, I pray we do. There's a lot to laugh at, right? He said, there is nothing so absurd or ridiculous that has not at some time been said by some philosopher. Can you think that through and maybe amen that this morning? Because it's true. Fontenelle, he says, says he would undertake to persuade the whole public of readers to believe that the sun was neither the cause of light or heat if he could only get six philosophers on his side. You kind of get what that's saying? If only I could get like the leading minds of the day, a few philosophers to agree with me on this absurd point that the sun neither provides heat nor light, everyone else would soon to believe the same thing. And that's how we kind of work, isn't it? A few leading minds, a few foolish philosophers get enough people to buy into what you're saying and pretty soon the culture's consumed by a belief even though it has no basis whatsoever. We see that in the world, right? And it's, it's what makes older folks kind of sigh at younger folks and like shake their heads a little bit and, I don't know, maybe a hands on the hip or something like, you know, just exasperation. Amen? But the sad thing is, is we do the same thing as Christians and we're going to see this same condition in the culture of the church at Thyatira today. So too in the church, uh, we see... Um, our own philosophies, our own ideas, our own version of what the Scriptures declare uh, as it describes the person of Jesus Christ and our relationship with Him. And what's interesting is a lot of these philosophies are loosely based maybe on some verse somewhere, but then they're kind of adapted, um, combined with our own imaginations and ideas into something that at the end of the day does not resemble at all what the Scriptures say once and for all as to who Jesus is and who we are in Him as His people. Can you amen that? We live in a culture that seeks to change Christianity in order to justify living in carnality or sinful activity, as we'll see this morning. Immorality, sexual immorality, idolatry, that is giving praise and honor and affection, our time, our talent, our treasures to everyone, including Jesus at the same time. And God says, that's not going to work. It's not okay. There are those who teach a doctrine that sounds something like this. Well, just profess Christ. Just be sincere in your heart and in your life. Just believe on Him, and then you're free to do whatever else, to live however you may choose. And God contradicts that false philosophy here in his word. But oftentimes we misinterpret that, don't we? We think sometimes that, you know, um, misinterpreting the difference between salvation, God's relationship with those who are not born again, not saved, and ourselves, we who are his kids, we who are his own dear children. And at times we forget that we have a passionate faithful father who parents his children. And we've talked about that previously. We've been kind of in that theme on Wednesday nights through the book of Judges as well, as God is allowing and even sending consequences that clash as they come against God's people. And they feel the weight, the intensity of those consequences. God lets those consequences come in regard to or to contradict our disobedience to turn our hearts back to him once again. How do you relate to your father in heaven? That's what Jesus said he is. Your father in heaven. How do you relate to him today? Did he just save you and then leave you alone? Forget about you, just not caring about you, allowing you to live however you choose, even harmfully, destroying yourself and damaging others around you? No. 
But as we simply read the Word of God, we see that perfect, passionate parent who speaks with authority into the lives of his kids, and he says, do this, and he says, avoid that. And should we choose to disobey or contradict his, his wisdom as it's given in the word, he doesn't forsake us, does he? Sometimes we think that. I've been a bad little boy or a bad little girl, and thus God's upset with me, God's mad at me, he's done with me. No. The Lord is never done with you. The Lord never falls out of love with you. But he will come to you, and he will correct you. And our prayer, our heart, is that we see his passion, that we see his love, and that we turn from our sin and choose him over those sinful things in order that we can maintain that right relationship. So much of our culture, just like Thyatira, is deluded. Amen? And that's D-E-L or D-I-L. Take whichever one you want. They both fit, right? We're deluded, and we're deluded, man. We're crazy. And so the Lord writes to a church that we might call, and you can write this down, the corrupted church at Thyatira. And if you didn't read ahead, get ready. Uh, we might call this letter strong medicine. Uh, and such is always the need when there's great sickness. Amen? Someone said this, and we'll get into our text. We must learn to discern. Today the lines of distinction are fuzzy. Don't be judge, ju pardon me, don't be judgmental, and that's good, but don't be gullible either. Amen? Using the right vocabulary does not mean that someone or something is authentic. Verse 18, let's read now. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira, Jesus says to John, write, these things says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience, and as for your works, the last are more than the first. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of their deeds. I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts." And I will give to each one of you according to your works. Now to you I say, verse 24, and to the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say, I will put on you no other burden. But he says, hold fast what you have till I come. And he who overcomes and keeps my work until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. He quotes Psalm 2 here. He shall rule them with an, a, a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessels, as I have also received from my Father. And I will give him the morning star. And then we wrap it up. We can read it together. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The author of Hebrews remind us, reminds us that no chastening, no discipline from your dad seems joyful in the present moment, but it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness if you listen to it, right? You receive it. So too our faithful father, our pass, uh, passionate parent, Jesus Christ, makes that appeal. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Thyatira, it's interesting to me, not much is written or recorded of this city or even of that church. It's called by historians the least important of the seven cities. We have no record of, of any real, you know, prominence as a church or persecution either. And we've talked about all these things in the prior letters and cities. 
Some have said that this is the most unimportant of all the cities that Jesus wrote to. And also, another Bible student said, it's insignificant in most every way. I find it interesting, firstly, that to such an insignificant, unimportant city that Jesus has the most to say. This is the longest letter that Jesus wrote to any other church. It's powerful, but I pray you see its power in its perfect message, its perfection, the passion of Jesus to speak truth into his people's life and to not just let them walk or run away, but to go after them in order that they might repent. What was called the most unimportant or insignificant city or church, Jesus has a lot to say. And that's a good reminder. You know, oftentimes in churches and in the body of Christ, there are those saints who feel unimportant or insignificant. And I think one of the ways in which our enemy uses that thought, and he seeks to separate us and isolate us and all those things, is that because we don't have a position or we're not a teacher or we don't have a ministry for whatever reason, we begin to think of ourselves as second-class citizens. Boy, if I don't show up next week, no one will notice. That's a lie. It doesn't really matter how holy I live or how passionately I follow Jesus because, you know, who am I really having an effect on? It's the leaders and pastors, and, and that's just crazy. To the most insignificant, unimportant church, Jesus has the most to say. And I pray something of that could be captured uh, by our hearts and minds this morning because the Bible contradicts any idea that one is more important than another in the body of Christ. If anything, the pastors are like the lowest on the rung of salvation. You know, right? Like as we, it's okay, you can laugh. As we sit around the, the grand table and the, the supper of the Lamb, we're going to be like on the end because we get so much attention and accolade. Jesus boasts over and over again of the one who prays in private and gives in secret, the one who has a personal relationship with him, who's not seen, who's insignificant, who seems unimportant, at least to the world and sometimes the church, but it's not the case with him. In fact, he gives extra attention, extra affection, and that's what we see in this letter to this church. Jesus cares, and because he cares, he corrects the surest sign of the love of God. Let's see what he has to say, verse 18, and to the angel of the church in Thyatira, write these things, says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. As always, in the beginning of every letter, Jesus references Revelation 1, where Jesus told John to write the things he has seen, yes, and that's Jesus Christ, chapter 1, section 1, and now we're in the things that, good job, the things that are chapters 2 and 3, the seven letters to the seven churches, but in Revelation 1, we see a description given of Jesus Christ, and Jesus takes a piece of that, a part of it, and puts it in the introduction of every letter because it's a message, it's a reminder, it's something important that has to do with the message that he's sending to his people. So because Jesus is going to say that, he says this about himself, reminding them of who he is. Firstly, these things says the Son of God. He reminds these people, these brothers and sisters, like you and me, this church, of his deity, and that's what's being expressed here. It's the only time that this title for Jesus is used in the whole book of Revelation. These things says the Son of God. And again, the emphasis is on his deity. The expression imparts equality between God the Father and God the Son. In this culture, and most of you know this, to be a son of something meant that you had the same nature as that someone or something, right? Here's an example, Mark 3, verse 17. You remember that Jesus called James and John the sons of thunder, right? Now, does that mean that one day thunder met a cloud and, you know, that they literally were the offspring of thunder? No, but it's an expression that imparts, you know, the nature, similarity, 
Equality, identity, right? Sons of thunder because they wanted to call fire down from heaven to consume Christ's enemies. Let's just tear them up, Lord. Let's burn them up. And Jesus said, no. Sons of thunder. So too with Jesus Christ, with God the Son. He shares the divine nature of God. He's deity. And as we talk about kind of just the, man, the dilution and maybe the dilutedness of our culture, We've got to get this one right. It scares me how often Christians are confused when it comes to the subject of the deity of Christ. And they don't know. They don't have an answer. Some will say that the Bible never speaks to it. And that's just crazy. I don't know what book they're reading. God help them. But if Jesus isn't God, salvation doesn't work. As the author of Hebrews teaches us. And so Jesus claims to be equal with the Father By this simple expression, he reminds these guys of his deity that he speaks with authority. These things says the Son of God. Secondly, who has eyes like a flame of fire. His eyes are not fire, but they are like a flame of fire. Back to chapter 1. You can get our studies through chapter 1 as we develop these things a little further. But that idea, that illustration, reminds us that Jesus sees with perfect purity and perfect clarity. He looks into your life. He looks into my heart, where I think no one else can see. And he knows everything. He sees with purity and clarity so he can judge righteously. And that's what he's about to do for these Christians. He's about to pronounce some judgment promise some correction. And so it fits. Lastly, Jesus said, John writes, these things says the Son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. In the original language, it speaks of the refining process, refined, brilliant, pure, perfect brass, as it were, having been, you know, refined in the fire. It speaks of purity. It speaks of the steadfastness of his ability. He's constant. He's immovable. He makes perfect decisions and doesn't regret them later. Wouldn't that be nice? But it also is a reference to judgment. And sometimes that's a subject that we confuse as Christians. The Bible says that judgment begins at the house of God. That's with you and me. Judgment is coming upon the world eternally should they persist in rejecting Jesus Christ. But judgment, there's biblical context, and that concept is important for us as Christians. The Lord's looking at us, loving us, inspecting us, and he's going to speak truth to us. And I pray it's something that we receive and embrace and listen as his spirit would so lead. Jesus says, now speaking, verse 19, I know your works, love, service, faith, your patience, and as for your works, what a compliment this is. These are words of encouragement and affirmation. As we've noted in every letter, Jesus first points out something positive before he corrects. He doesn't just, you know, let both barrels fly in anger or frustration. But as a parent, he speaks positively first and then He lays it on. He praises his people. I know your works, love, service, faith, your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. It's the least of all the cities called unimportant, insignificant, and yet Jesus just speaks in the same way. I know your works. It's what he has said to every other city in every single letter. I know you. And thus I can speak accurately into your life. Hear what I'm saying. It's as simple as that. Sometimes we take offense to things that are said in the Bible or in a study by the person who's leading. And generally, generally, unless it's incorrect, right? It's because we're guilty, right? Remember who's talking to you. It's, it's Jesus. I see you. I know you. I love you. I'm going to speak some truth to you. I know your works. It may not apply to you. But if it does, I trust and pray we will listen. 
I know your works. Four things he says about this church and that city that are significant, your love, your service, your faith, your patience. These are things that we should seek to, you know, excel in. As Paul said, these are uh, essential qualities for we Christians, for the church, love for the Lord, love for each other. Above all else, that people, when they walk through the door, they can see that we love the Lord and that we love each other. So essential. Service, that is labor. Putting on the apron, washing each other's feet. Those who don't yet know the Lord. Faith, to step out in ministry. Patience, so important. This is a divine characteristic that can only be uh, perfected among Christians because we trust the Lord. So we wait and we allow God to do what he's doing and when the time is right, we trust that he'll meet the need, take care of the issue. We're a patient people. But look what Jesus says and how he praises these guys. He says, as for your works, the last are more than the first. You're doing better today than you ever have before. Good job. That's incredible. That's one of the greatest compliments we can give one another in the Lord. You're not much, but you're not what you used to be. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. But isn't that what you say to yourself? Isn't that how you encourage yourself? I'm not much, but at least I'm not what I used to be. That means you're alive. That means that you're not dead. Dead men, dead ladies can't grow. They can't mature. They can't bear fruit. If you don't have fruit, you're not alive. You're dead. If there's been change, the uh, 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 fruit of the Spirit of God is, is being kind of manifested. It's, it's maturing and being perfected in you. Praise the Lord, man. Stop thinking that you're not saved and rejoice because it can't come any other way. These guys are doing great. They're growing. They're maturing. You're doing better today than you ever have before, but... Here's where it gets tough, guys. Verse 20. Nevertheless, and again, it's the same word that we noted two letters back, and it means this, despite all good. Despite all the good that's going on, I have a few things against you. Because you allow, and you can underline that word if you want, Because you allow that woman, Jesus says specifically, he's talking about a person here who calls herself a prophetess because you allow that woman Jezebel to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality, eat things, sacrifice to idols. I have a few things against you. I gave her time to repent of her sexual sin and she did not repent, the Lord says. This is interesting. It's unique among all the seven churches. There was a central figure, uh, a singular person that was the the source of this this corruption, uh, the controversy in this place at that time. And Jesus calls her Jezebel. Now that's probably not her name, right? That's a name associated with evil and infamy, as we'll see in a moment. And so it probably wasn't as she handed out her business cards, you know, Jezebel. Also see Balaam, and remember we talked about that? Nicolaitan kind of stuff on there. Uh, Wolves come to you in sheep's clothing, right? They don't identify themselves as false prophets and false teachers. That's why you look for the fruit. That's how you identify them. Amen? Jesus calls her Jezebel, and this again is an illustration for us. We can look to the Old Testament. For those of you who are not aware, write these verses down. 1 Kings 16. Maybe you don't know where that is. Ask someone out to lunch and say, hey, tell me about Ahab and Jezebel and Elijah. And they will. 1 Kings 16, 2 Kings chapter 9, we see this uh, representative uh, of idolatry, sexual immorality. This figure called Jezebel. And Jesus, specifically speaking of a person, associates that person with this infamous character from the Old Testament. Self-appointed prophetess. 
after the example or the person of Jezebel that we see in the Old Testament. Someone said this, the name Jezebel had a powerful association. If we call someone a Judas or a Hitler, it would mean something strong. It's also a strong thing to call this woman Jezebel. She was one of the most evil characters of the Old Testament who attempted to combine the worship of Israel with the worship of the idol Baal. Jezebel herself had a most unenviable record of evil. Want to know what this person was like in Thyatira? Well, just read about Jezebel in the Old Testament. It works the same way. Note that Jesus said, She calls herself a prophetess. She claims to have, you know, super spirituality, uh, to be an oracle of God, and she'll answer your questions, and she'll tell you who to be, how to live, what to do. She's not a prophetess, but she claims to be one. The problem is that the people, the Christians of Thyatira, received her, believed her, listened to her. It happens in life, but scripturally we're told exactly what to do. If it's in the church, to warn, to rebuke, and then to remove. If it's outside of the church, then do the same, but distance yourself. If that person persists in inviting you to indulge in iniquity, watch out. The problem here was is that God's people knew and did nothing. In fact, they participated. Here's what she did, and Jesus identifies it and reveals it. She calls herself a prophetess. She teaches and seduces my servants to commit sexual sin and to eat things, associate themselves with idols. She's a priestess of, you know, sin and iniquity, encouraging believers to engage in immorality, idolatry, leading them, seducing them, encouraging them to engage in these things as though the Lord doesn't care, as though it's a cultural thing. The culture was a big part of what we see here. We don't have much time to get into that, but we can look outside our door and see it as well. How we enable sin, even in our midst, and in Christian churches, because we say nothing, we refuse to call it what it is, and thus we enable it by not taking a stand against it. That's what she did. Notice how Jesus refers to his defensiveness of his own people, his kids. She teaches and seduces my servants to do all these things. Um, They're my servants. They belong to me. They're my kids, my people. And I take offense to that, we might say is what Jesus is communicating here. Those who might seduce others into sin, that's a big, big no-no. You don't do that with Jesus' bride. You don't do that with God's kids, right? Mark 9, 42, Jesus said, but whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. Dig that, right? <laughs> I have a problem with this, the Lord declares. Don't mess with a protective parent. Don't eat your lunch, right? And that's what Jesus is saying. That's the passion behind this letter. And the love that's in the heart of this perfect parent as he talks directly to this situation, those who enabled this to go on. And certainly the center figure of it all. Notice what Jesus says, and this is God talking. So this is just powerful, right? I gave her time to repent. And she didn't. That's that's amazing. I pray we never miss Every single time we open this glorious Word of God, I pray we never miss His grace. That's incredible to me. Jezebel, man. (laughs) And, And she gets the same grace of God that you and I do too. Isn't that glorious? None of us deserve it, but 
all of us can benefit from it, we can receive it. Isn't that amazing? There's no sin that's too great, no distance that's too far that God's grace cannot bring you back from. That's amazing to me. That's the stuff that we better be teaching and preaching as believers, especially to those who are lost. I gave her time to repent. She refused. This Jezebel rejected the work of the Holy Spirit, convicting her. God gave her time without confrontation, without correction, without consequences. That's the crazy part about parenting, right? And we're, we're on our knees desperately about that issue as parents, and we should be. But God knows what he's doing, right? So he gives Jezebels and people like you and me time, space to repent. He's convicting us, he's calling us, and he's waiting. Because he's gracious, long-suffering, slow to anger, rich in love. That's amazing to me. That's the mercy of God. It's just extravagant, isn't it? Time to repent. God gave Jezebel, he says divinely, time to repent, she refused. We've got to remember to practice the same with those in our lives too, especially brothers and sisters. That's the context of this letter. We're a little hard on each other sometimes, especially new believers. And I think there's reason for that at times. It's not good. It's never justifiable. We've got issues, and hopefully we know it. But as God gives people space and time to repent, I pray we do the same. Judgment is coming because she rejected the work of the Holy Spirit, calling her to repent. She refused. This grace of God that we're talking about, this space of time that we have to repent, it's not unlimited, is it? God said in Genesis 6-3, my spirit shall not strive with man forever. We've got to take advantage of the time that we have to repent. Or the Lord will turn up the heat, won't he? Because he loves you. Because he loves me. He gives space and opportunity, time to repent, and God help us, we've got to take advantage of it. Jesus is talking about Jezebel here, but note that he's still speaking to the church. Good things are going on, but they're corrupt. They're allowing this corruption to continue, doing nothing at all about it. Jesus is going to go on to say, I'll deal with Jezebel. You change the course of your heart. Someone said it wasn't necessarily a large group following Jezebel, but a little leaven affects a whole lump of dough. And a few in immorality and idolatry will corrupt the whole church, especially if they influence others the way this Jezebel did. Verse 22, God says, here's what I'm going to do. Not you, me. I'm the perfect parent, the Lord can say here. Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of their deeds. I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know what we willfully sometimes forget, that I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your works." This is the principle, we might say, comparatively, of sowing and reaping, isn't it? This isn't salvation, but it's that spiritual law of sowing and reaping. Sow to the flesh, I'm going to give you according to your works. I'm going to let you have it. If you want it, go get it. It'll kill you. It'll hurt, but I'll be there. Sow to the things of the Spirit, walk in the Spirit. It's life. I will give to each one of you according to your works. Jesus says, I'm going to cast her into a sickbed. Before he tells these believers what to do, and we'll get there in a minute, he says what he's going to do. I'm going to take care of this issue. It's my house, my church. 
I'm going to exercise authority over it. I'm going to bring some consequences, some discipline. I'm going to chastise Jezebel here, cast her into a sickbed, along with those who commit adultery with her. Some very well might die, those who were following after her. Those who were caught up in the adultery spiritually and literally that she's peddling or preaching. Someone said, for this reason, the figure of a sickbed is fitting. They were guilty of adultery, both sexual and spiritual. It is as if Jesus says, you love an unclean bed, here, I'll give you one, and cast you into a sickbed. Someone else said, what was the sickbed? It could simply be an image of affliction, or it could be a literal sickness that Jesus would allow in the lives of Jezebel and her followers as corrective chastisement consequences, and we have a biblical basis for that. Note the purpose of this consequence, of these kinds of discipline. Jesus tells us, I'm going to do all this unless they repent. That's the purpose of the huh, divine discipline of God for those who are his kids. It's to wake us up and draw us to a place of repentance where we say, you know what, enough of this nonsense. The grace of God kills me because he doesn't allow the full consequence to come. At least we don't start there. As much as we want to rebel, the farther we go, ah, things get worse. So respond to his teaching and his training. He called them to repent, and they refused, and so now he's got to speak a little more loudly. Cast them into a sickbed, maybe some unto death. Verse 24, Jesus transitions. He speaks to a different part of the congregation. Not just to those who are in error, but to those who are faithful. He says, now to you I say, and the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say. I will put on you no other burden. Hold fast what you have till I come. Even in the midst of like this serious situation, I mean, this is radical. There were still faithful, uncompromising Christians who were standing their ground, holding fast. They weren't stopping. They weren't bailing. They weren't quitting. They were teaching their kids and leading the church. They weren't distracted. They weren't discouraged by what was going on, but they were doing it. They were the remnant. They were faithful, maybe even the majority. We see as we look back in history. So Jesus simply encourages them, doesn't he? Hold on, hold fast, he says. What you have until I come, I'll lay on you no other burden. It's amazing. Hang in there, I'm on my way. And that day is when our battle is over. And that's why we say, come quickly, Lord Jesus, amen? Verse 26, moving to a close. And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, not your works, my works, right? Which we see in his word, right? He who overcomes, and, and, and as always, note the context of the statement, the word, powerful word, speaks of labor and energy and difficulty, it's tough to stand fast when you're surrounded by those who say, let sin so that grace may abound, immorality, idolatry. He who overcomes, some promises are made here. Uh, the peaceable fruit of righteousness. He who overcomes and keeps my works until the end to him, he says, firstly, I will give power or authority to rule over the nations. And again, he quotes Psalm 2, wherein we see Jesus ruling and reigning on the earth. This is the 
period, uh, uh, the, the millennial reign of Jesus Christ after his second coming. We'll get to that later. But we come back to the earth with the Lord Jesus, and there we rule and reign with him for a thousand years. And righteousness for the first time in earth's history will be legislated. It will be enforced with a symbolic rod of iron. That is, there's no other way it's going to be because God is ruling and reigning from the city of Jerusalem. And he's giving us authority, the authority to rule and reign with him. And we'll talk about that later. He shall rule them with the rod of iron. Those who disagree, they shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessels. You know. As I also have received from my Father that authority, I'm going to give it to you. Secondly, Jesus says, and I will give him the morning star. What's that? Super cool provocative, exciting. We've got a Bible verse, folks. Revelation 22, verse 16. There we read that Jesus himself is the morning star. And that's beautiful imagery. Not super cool treasure. What are you going to do with it in heaven anyway? But isn't heaven going to be paradise because of who's there? Isn't that the greatest gift we could ever hope to receive? Why we've come to Christ in the the first place? It's for freedom and, and fellowship. It's for something that we've longed for our whole lives that's led us to Christ that nothing else can satiate, satisfy, or or fulfill. It's it's just Him. And so we receive the gift of Himself, the reward of Himself, as we stand fast and are faithful. It's incredible to me. It's the culmination of the Christian life, isn't it? Uh, to, to, To be known as we're known, to see, though we see in a glass or mirror dimly, darkly, now we're gonna see Jesus face to face shortly. That's the high point of our life. That's what we long for more than anything else. I tell you what, the nonsense about sitting on a cloud and playing a harp like a fat baby for all eternity, I'm just not really into that. But to stare upon an infinite, eternal God within there's no variation or shadow of turning. From every glance and every perspective, you see perfect beauty. I'm into that. Lastly, he who has an ear, and let's do it. Come on, roll up your sleeves. Go like this. He who has an ear, we have two. I pray we use them. He who has an ear, let him hear or listen to, receive appropriately what the Spirit says to the churches. Again, it's plural. What's being spoken here is for everybody, isn't it? How does it apply to you? It's a great reminder in regard to Bible studies. I think that it's inappropriate for pastors unless the Scripture is crystal clear to tell you where you're at and what to do. Because what do we know? Amen? It's the Holy Spirit's job to interpret and to provide personal application of his word to his people. I like that there's a, 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 a range of recipients in this letter. You know, uh, uh, different aspects of the audience, as it were. How does this letter hit you, and what condition are you? Most of the time, we don't know. That's why we just speak the word and let the Lord do his thing, right? The Lord's speaking to Jezebel here, right? Maybe that's you. Those who seduce and lead others into sin, God help you. You better repent. You better turn. You may be in a season of grace. You may be given space to repent, but it's, it's coming to a close and things are not going to be good. The Lord's going to come and fight against you with the word of his mouth. We, we read last week, it's radical. So you better repent. Maybe you're a follower of people like Jezebel. So, uh, people say, come on, let's live in sin so that grace may abound. And you go and you do that. You better repent. You better get right. The Lord loves you. He's going to allow consequences to come to wake you up and get your attention with the hope that you'll choose to repent. Thirdly, there are those we see in this letter 
who don't participate, but they let it happen. They pretend that they don't see. They enable sin to just have its way with God's people because they won't take a stand. They won't say, you know what? That's wrong. That's not biblical. As for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. That's not what we're going to tolerate in our midst. It's not okay. Those who enable sin by permitting it, allowing it, better repent. Lastly, fourthly, there are those that the Lord just praises here, right? Those who are faithful, those who are taking a stand, those who are holding fast to his word. Praise God for that. If that's you, be encouraged. Keep it up. I know it's tiring, (laughs) exhausting. Don't be discouraged. Don't think that you're alone because you're not. Stand fast. The Lord's on his way. Amen? So however this hits you this morning, I pray that you ask the Holy Spirit and that you listen to what he has to say as he diagnoses the condition of your heart. It's amazing, isn't it? It's so new covenant. Someone said this, it's sobering to realize that you may be doing many things right and still be headed down the wrong path. We can be like the church at Thyatira whose growing works demonstrated their love, yet because of their lack of discernment, they were guilty of tolerating false teaching. Someone else said, and this is so current for us, our politically correct times may lull us into believing that striving for discernment is wrong. But watch out when someone tells you that all paths lead to truth or that a sincerely held belief, regardless of what it is, is all that's important. Compromise can lead to spiritual death just as surely as Jezebel's corrupt, self-made religion resulted in her being cast into her sickbed. The Lord speaks to us, he appeals to us, he reaches out to us, and I trust and pray that we'll listen, amen? Father, we don't ever want to be in the place where we are wise in our own eyes, where we say, that doesn't apply to me, but we want to open our hearts because we know we can trust you, because we know you see with perfect clarity. We know that you've paid the price for our sin on the cross of Calvary. There's no question of your love, that you're passionate for us, you chase after us, you plead with us, you pray over us. You work so perfectly so that we can just see that you are right, that sin stinks, and to live in fellowship with you. Help us, Lord, to recall all these things, to trust you, and then to let you apply your word to our hearts today. The sword of the Spirit, God, apply it. What camp do we fall into? The solution, Lord, is so simple. Soften our hearts to be a people who repent, Lord, quickly, constantly, daily, Lord. If there's something major that we need to come clean of today, God, there is grace here. There is help and support. There is mercy. There's compassion. Lord, don't let us leave and close our heart, resisting this call to repentance. Would your spirit be working, purifying your people, calling us to enjoy what you've given us at such a high price, Lord? Have your way with us, God, we're asking today. Lord, we've got a world of people surrounding us that are going to hell. They're going to be separated from you in a place made for the devil and his angels forever. We are not okay with that. Maybe we have struggles or difficulties, God, but we choose to say that those souls are worth more than our present pleasure. Maybe it's not sin, but maybe it's just folly, God. 
Maybe it is idolatry. You tell us, Lord. Help us, we pray, to see souls as the greatest treasure that we could live for and chase after. Make your aim our goal, we pray. And so bless us as we do. Lord, I love your blessings in these letters, each one unique, because right choices pay off with such things that the world can't give or know. So fill us with your joy and your peace, God. All that you are and all that you have as we choose to follow you. In Jesus' name, let's say together, amen, we say, amen. God richly bless you and your week. Before we go, if you need some personal ministry, don't leave today. If you need prayer for a circumstance, a situation, if you need healing, if you just need some encouragement from a brother or a sister, we've got some elders some sweet ladies up front to tend to you, to care for you and pray for you and encourage you. So don't be, don't miss out on the opportunity. If you need a little, a little personal ministry today, come forward and they'll be delighted to pray for you. Enjoy some fellowship before you go. God bless your week.